interesting about this. It's not very new for uh, nursing. It's not very new in our medical profession. And uh, if in very simple words, I have to say it is from the, the bench to the bedside to the community in simple terms. What we do in lab, what we find out, new interventions, validation of some um, manipulation, then uh, some drug or some design of some equipment. It can be anything which is starting from the lab simulation or in a otherwise uh, clinical lab to the bedside, then to the community, to the clinic. That's in very simple words. And uh, we will have the uh, whole lot of discussion about uh, the examples also at the end. Uh, to just to introduce that you have heard about evidence evidence based research evidence. So that is very much in demand nowadays by policymakers, by public, by healthcare uh, personnel anywhere in the world. Whatever we talk of that this uh, you remember when vaccine was in discussion, this uh, COVID vaccine, there was everybody was having a concern whether there is evidence of its efficacy, uh, success rate, because nowadays it's a trend that nobody, whether it is a policymaker or a public or a health professional, accepts a, um, a regime or a uh, this uh, intervention unless they see the story of success. So that's the evidence. Uh, that is what is generated in translational research. Then identification of efficacious interventions. Intervention also should be very effective. Uh, efficacious means and therapies, medications, which are both practical and cost effective is crucial nowadays. Everybody is looking for a cost effective solutions. And translating research into practice is easing out or it improves the health related outcomes in cost effective manner. Next slide, please. So uh, that's the reason why we are discussing today translational research. <coughs> uh, lots of medicines you must have heard are like some medicines are uh, invented for, uh, for example, anticholinergic drugs but they are used to control the bleeding, used to control the PPH. So there, this is all through translational research only that evidence has been collected and which has been validated and then on human trials and then FDP approval and then coming into the market. So that's the whole process which is adopted and translational research is the connection between the basic science microbiology toxicology biochemistry physics the basic science and the patient care outcomes based on these uh, uh, these um, pure science subjects which we study in labs the research is done and then it is utilized for the patients and translational research can be thought of the connection between clinical outcomes and healthcare policy, because healthcare policies are also based on the clinical outcomes. Now, when uh, the policy came for uh, management of PPH, uh, postpartum hemorrhage, uh, the Ministry of Health and uh, Family Welfare decided on the dosage, decided on the uh, on the uh, key healthcare providers who will be allowed to use this under, uh, I think, um, under K section of the drugs. Uh, so they, <coughs> they were given approval uh, on that. So it is also based on this research. And translational research is translating basic research findings uh, to clinical areas, or you can say to the bedside level. And we have seen many uh, research um, in our experience and we'll see it into next slide into two phases. If we divide it into translational research into two things, uh, that is T1 and T2 will be the next slide. 
T1 is bent to bedside. That is, it includes the application of findings generated during research in the laboratory or in preclinical pre studies to the development of trials and studies in humans. Uh, as I said that first it is done in lab, then on animals, then coming to the uh, humans, which is a clinical trials, and then finally FDB, uh, FDA approval, and then coming into the market. That's the flow in uh, T1 also. Uh, I was a member of ethical committee for last eight years, and uh, I have seen the protocols which they write for uh, clinical trials. So uh, can I have next slide, please? Uh, Rana, can you please mute? Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, then the second part of this is T2. It involves the translation of new therapies. Uh, new therapies, when I say, there are many uh, therapies which even uh, in physiotherapy branch I have seen, they design, they uh, invent new therapies to relieve now the cervical pain, the backache, uh, the knee pain. For that, they, they design different therapies. So mm -hmm. then they also uh, do it, uh, this systematic, uh, this research process in their laboratories, wet lab, and then translate it into practice. Uh, this is resulting from the clinical research studies to clinical practice including adoption of new therapies or practices in clinics and in community. So bedside to community now. Uh, I will give you the another example apart from what is written. One of my PhD student did a study on finding out, developing a tool to assess the efficacy of work around in our clinical area. When you say work around in simple words, in India, we everywhere hear the word jugad. Jugad means something to fit in, which works. In Hindi, we call it as jugad, uh, but otherwise, it is a work around. Uh, so, mm. that he did a study uh, and developed a tool. Okay. De he developed a tool which will assess the efficacy of that workaround. For example, many places nurses are using gloves instead of tourniquet. The places where it is not available, they use it. So this is coming under the list of workaround that they do it, how effective it is and how safe it is. He did a study and developed a tool to assess that. So that is also, I will rate it as translational research, put it into T2, uh, in the section T2, the two areas of translational research. One is T1, which we have discussed. Second is T2. So I will place that study or that research work in T2 that he has developed it. And now you can check those work around in your clinical setting and see that whether it is safe for the patient effective for the patient or not. And then again, there is one more study which we are going to do is we are we should not discuss it's going to be copyright. But just for your better understanding, I'm saying that uh, in ICU, we find that who is the best nurse, who is second best, third best so that we can assign patients accordingly. So we are developing a matrix that which will be used to identify that who is a best nurse in that. So that's these are the examples of T2 translational research in nursing, which we are already doing and we can think of doing more. Next slide, please. So translational research now giving this description, we can come to the what are the goals? Either we want uh, some development of some new idea. So then we have to take it take it up as translational research to bring out some new idea. Then exploration of new interventions and therapy 
which can improve the health related outcomes. Um, you, you might have seen in uh, OBGY ward that sisters, our students are also using instead of breast pump, uh, we cut the uh, side of the syringe, one side of the syringe and put the barrel from the opposite side and pull it, use it as a uh, breast pump. So this is also exploration of new intervention, which will improve the engorgement of breast and help the patients, which is cost effective, which is having no side effects. Then speed up scientific discovery into patient uh, and community benefit. For patient and community benefit, uh, I will give example of vaccine here. So it was a very, very fast uh, uh, invention or uh, intervention which came into the market, uh, even though the, uh, the sum of the steps are uh, missing in that, now we all were guinea pigs. So uh, data is being collected now and will be, uh, will be out after some time for its real efficacy data. Then discover the cost effective interventions. The example of breast, uh, the syringe which we use, I gave you, that's the kind of uh, cost effective interventions. And there are plenty of interventions, even if we keep a, uh, keep a competition among our own students that you have to develop some cost effective intervention to help the client, to help the patients, maybe in comfort or relief of some uh, some of the sign and symptoms. We can give that exercise and I'm sure of that you will find some of the interventions which can be which can go for copyright also. Uh, next please. Uh, next slide. So for translational research, there are three phases. Uh, three phases. Basic science which we see usually is done for most of the time in microbiology or uh, toxicology, these research areas, uh, lab discovery and preclinical research. But clinical research and clinical medicine research is definitely is done by nurses and for nurses also. In clinical research, human clinical trials, uh, usually human clinical trials are done after preclinical pre research, which is done on mice, which is done on animals, uh, which is done on maybe simulators also. Now, human clinical trials are done with lot of safety network. Uh, when we were doing approval of uh, the clinical uh, trials, um, uh, the protocols, for uh, our Ranbexy, now it is Sun Pharma, uh, in ethical committee, we were looking at every aspect of it. How many side effects, weighing the side effect uh, versus the benefits. Then taking care of the human rights aspect, taking care of uh, the risk which they are taking uh, for. For example, the trials where the side effect is on fertility. Then in those trials, we also always uh, disapprove the, um, the female uh, candidates, uh, female uh, volunteers, because volunteers come and register them. We do whole screening of volunteers and they, then they are given the drug trials. So uh, in that, we were so cautious that even for some of the uh, drug trials, we were not permitting female candidates to be volunteers. It is against acuity, acuity, which we say that acuity, acuity equivalence and all that, but still we were not giving females that. And then uh, some other examples also, I remember if time permits, I'll uh, discuss those later on, what all experiences we have seen in uh, these human clinical trials. There was a, can, there was a volunteer, uh, volunteer who fallen down after the after that uh, this uh, trial was done but for the fracture treatment of fracture then keeping in him in hospital doing everything all cost is borne by the by the agency who is doing these clinical trials and there is a whole lot of um, instructions which are written uh, and it is always seen their insurance is also done for the volunteers 
So lot of things are in place. Then these trials are done. And once these trials data is collected, the report is made and then sent to FDA and then the approval is given. So it's a long process. Then clinical medicine, uh, which we do, adoption of best practices in clinicals, clinics, like for example, in maternity, I remember uh, many times uh, we did a study on, uh, on the uh, birthing positions and we have seen uh, that uh, the position which was routinely used, uh, the lithotomy is least effective and the position which is, uh, which we is squatting or uh, side line position lateral is uh, considered as best because adoption of best practices is also done through translational research. Uh, in lot of things, we do that. There was one hand raise I saw, but I think after the presentation, we'll take up all questions, uh, all your concerns, issues. So in lot of things, we use translational research in drugs, in diagnostics, in therapy, in medical field, in procedures. Uh, we also see way the Cause and uh, cause and effect theory also is used here, and uh, in in the basic science in lab we do uh, studies in vitro, and then it is coming to hum animals, and then coming to humans, and then finally the approval. So um, we can see each one in uh, uh, further. I have given uh, examples uh, side by side, but we can go to next slide, uh, seeing the basic science research which is done in the lab and it provides the foundation of knowledge of the applied science and it encompasses familiar scientific disciplines such as biochemistry, microbiology, physiology, pharmacology, uh, toxicology and their interplay and it involves uh, the laboratory studies uh, with cell cultures, animal studies, or physiological experiments. Next slide. Next is preclinical research, where uh, uh, which involves the ev uh, evaluation of potential therapeutic interventions in cells and animals. And candidates for entry into clinical trials can then be selected based on their effectiveness and safety in these disease models. Disease models, these, uh, these mice and uh, guinea pigs, uh, in them it is used and then there is an entry of volunteers. Next slide, please. That's clinical research then. Um, it involves human participants and helps to translate the research done in the lab into new treatment uh, protocols or treatment for the benefit of patients and clinical trials as well as research in epidemiology, physiology and pathophysiology, health services, education, outcomes and mental health are under the clinical research umbrella. Whatever we do, uh, we see in our nursing research also most of the things or many of uh, many of them are coming under clinical research. Next slide. This process from basic research to discovery to clinical research, which I had explained in very simple words that how it starts from the um, science lab to the, uh, to the drug coming out in market, the intervention coming out in the market. So in that is explained in a little um, formalized steps, this process. So it is early stage preclinical trial development then late stage preclinical trial development. And in uh, early stage, we have protection agreement, preclinical testing research, and pre-investigational new drug protocol development. So uh, uh, we will see each one by one, what does the meaning, what is the meaning of protection agreement? Next slide, please. Protection agreement. Uh, the process from basic research discovery to clinical research first thing is a protection agreement. Uh, protections are needed to ensure successful translation of the research discovery to clinical application in the future. And for that, there are a lot of legal, uh, legal formalities which are to be done. 
and I have seen um, by chance the topic is given to me and I was involved into all four steps uh, with my uh, clinical trial um, center. And uh, we have seen that how thick these doziers are. These are called doziers. And <clears throat> each dozier ha has to go to the people in that committee and they study 15 days minimum time is given. They study each word of it, material transfer agreement, confidential disclosure agreement, intellectual property agreement, and then invention disclosure report. All these are legal and very confidential uh, documents which except the uh, the trial agency and the committee members only they can share it and if it is shared breach uh, the confidentiality is breached then there is a huge penalty also uh, in master transfer agreement uh, it protects the rights of both parties uh, in the transfer of research material both parties means uh, the volunteers and the place where it is being done. Uh, then confidential disclosure agreement is uh, known as non-disclosure disagreement uh, for protection of confidential information. Next slide, next to next. Information needed for transfer of confidential information between a company and the university or the place where the trial is done. It must be signed by the university officials also. Uh, you can skip to three slides. <clears throat> then intellectual property agreement uh, for compliance with the sponsored research agreement terms and conditions for disclosure of interventions and compliance with provisions of sponsored research agreements. And intervention disclosure report is for equity, equity review and potential protection of discovery. That the the thing which is coming out is serving the principle of equity and both gets chance to review it uh, both has uh, rights to review and give their opinion on the protocols next slide preclinical testing research uh, the preclinical testing requires to be completed before moving a new drug into clinical research uh, the following aspects are to be considered the type of formulation. It can be powder. It can be liquid. It can be sprinkled powder. It can be spray. There are variety of uh, formulations. So what type of formulation it is? Then root of drug administration because it can be oral. It can be rectal. It can be trans uh, um, uh, buckle. Then uh, there are uh, IM, IV different routes are there. Then safety specifications, maximum tolerated dose, which we have gathered from preclinical <clears throat> thing. Then drug excretion, how is the excretion, liver, kidneys, where is the main impact? Bioavailability of drug, uh, single dose administration to determine the amount of drug in blood, then drug efficacy. How efficacy? What is the percentage of efficacy? Next slide, please. Uh, Pre-interventional new drug. Uh, Pre-interventional new drug. When we talk about this, in uh, the preparation for an application should be initiated when preclinical testing research is near to be completed and preclinical efficacy is demonstrated. Then meeting with FDA for new drug development is to be done. As I told you, once you are done with the uh, with the preclinical trials, results are uh, supporting the uh, supporting your trials. Then it has to go to the uh, IND application. You have to fill that and go to the FDA. Next is late stage clinical uh, development, preclinical development, where drug manufacturing, pharmacology or toxicology, clinical protocols, and IND submission is done. Next slide, drug manufacturing. When I say the drug manufacturing provides specific information necessary for the IND, such as data which supports the purity, identify strength and stability under various conditions, such as temperature, light, 
time, like oxytocin, how did we reach to the conclusion that it should not be below the 27 degrees or it is to be kept in fridge? Uh, most of the drugs, we, uh, we write that it should be kept in dark. Uh, how much uh, is the shelf life and how, how long it can be kept? All that is uh, the specification we need to see. Then purity profile consistent with the material used in non-clinical toxicology studies. Uh, and then formulation consistent between the drug used in non-clinical studies and clinical formulation. Uh, drug formulation used in phase one clinical trials may simply be an oral suspension or a suspension dose, but may be different than the final manufactured drug. Because there we want, uh, uh, for example, in uh, the clinical trials I have seen, they use the um, apple custard sprinkle on apple custard. Then when the final drug is made, it is in the form of uh, tablet or it is in the form of powder. So uh, formulations can change, but the main content remains the same. Next, this pharmacology is um, pharmacology or toxicology. Uh, it is to identify the safe starting dose or dose escalating scheme for proposed clinical trial. In all proposed clinical trial, initially the drug dose used is minimum. Then slowly, slowly as it is tolerated, not having much side effects, slowly it is escalated. And this includes monitoring of toxic effects on organs for identification of organ toxicity that should be specifically monitored in the proposed clinical trial. Then evaluate carcinogenicity and tetrogenicity risk. This is very important in all drugs. Common toxicology testing may include repeat dose toxicity, absorption, metabolism, genotoxicity and immunotoxicity. How much it uh, reduces the immunity? What is the absorption time? How long it takes? Everything is monitored with a checklist. There are hundreds of checklists for each, each and every aspect. Dose toxicity, absorption different, metabolism different, immunotoxicity different. So there are a uh, lot of checklists which are well validated by the experts, then they are used. The next is clinical protocol uh, uh, or IND submission. Uh, submission is uh, to the FDA, it is uh, done. And the following details for the clinical uh, protocol are extremely important uh, in the submission. That is, you have to clearly mention the starting dose, dose escalation, inclusion exclusion criteria for the population to be studied. The example which I gave you of uh, women candidates, not to volunteers, not to be included. And that is the uh, that it is kept very well written in exclusion criteria that it has effect on the evolution of a female. Therefore, no female volunteers. So it is very clearly written in exclusion criteria. Then definition of dose limiting toxicity that after 5 ml, the drug is toxic, was toxic on uh, the, uh, the preclinical trials. Therefore, here it is mentioned that this is the maximum dose, then monitoring of adverse effects. Most of the drugs we have seen that are having GIT uh, symptoms, for example, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, um, disturbance in the uh, in the gastric uh, gastroenteritis uh, gastric tract. Um, so these are the very very common. But some of the side effect adverse effects are very uncommon, and they are very carefully being studied. And if it is carcinogenic or uh, toxic effects are more, then the FDA says no to that drug trial. So it is not permitted. That is why it is very, very important that it is uh, FDA nod is uh, done before doing the trials. So next slide is go or hold on decision is taken by the FDA. And it takes 30 days when we submit our uh, protocol. They take 30 days time. If we don't hear anything about 
uh, does not hear or they do not contact that means our uh, this is acceptable and we get a letter also from them a nod nodding uh, or the permission that we can go ahead with the trials they are not taking long time uh, it's 30 days time is the usually uh, time which uh, they are supposed to give us the go or hold on decision the next once the sponsor is notified of the issues the sponsor has 30 days and we can amend mm -hmm. the protocol get approval uh, fda approval on of the amendments then proceed with the protocol because they in first go usually there are three four amendments or three four issues which they raise which the sponsor has to correct it and then resubmit it and then you again get the approval uh, not amend or and or uh, the amendments is not approved by the fda protocol is placed on the clinical hold until all the issues are addressed uh, but it is must that you get uh, their approval then clinical research which we see a lot is done in our practice areas also clinical research can be described as translating lab discoveries to treatments we know that alkalines are good for uh, good for our stomach when there is acidity these are done in lab that alkali uh, acidic uh, the, their ph levels all these uh, things are known from the lab but how we are translating it or utilizing it into our clinical practice that is to be done in uh, translating lab discoveries to treatments that in, it involves a person or a group of people it uses materials from humans for example the vaccine which was uh, which was made uh, it was from the um, the covid affected person only the uh, uh, the content was taken then clinical research includes clinical trials and is essential for bringing research discoveries to to communities next slide clinical uh, research there are uh, phases of clinical research uh, next slide uh, phase 1 2 3 4 i think uh, in my discussion i have uh, already explained these uh, these phases in the phase 1 which evaluate the first the safety determine the safe dosage identify side effects then phase 2 test effectiveness and further evaluate that safety because safety is continuous till the fourth phase also i would say then phase 3 is confirm effectiveness and monitor the side effects compared to other treatments and collect the information and then phase 4 provide additional information after approval including risk benefits and its use so it is to be weighed very carefully uh, we always see in research also this benefit sh should over shine uh, the risk then we we take up that uh, trial or that intervention next is clinical medicine that was the uh, third phase one when i was describing the types the research utilization at clinical level and who on clinical trial results states that it is unethical to conduct human research without publication and dissemination of the results of that research as withholding results may subject future volunteers to unnecessary risk therefore they say that it is to be published whatever is the outcome maybe it is causing uh, some side effects uh, uh, like for <coughs> anti cancerous drugs we have seen that how many side effects are there there's alopecia now slowly slowly you must have observed that the side effects are less even with uh, anti cancerous drugs because safety is seen throughout and trials are continuously done to uh, reduce as much as possible the side effects that is why for cancer so many drugs we see now and with less side effects initially they were saying that it contains lead and lead is a low poison it's a poison therefore it is going to 
uh, kill the your healthy cells also therefore these these side effects will be there but now i have seen in practice also that side effects have been minimized to a great extent uh, the one which we saw 20 years ago uh, translational research in nursing next slide uh, some of the examples which i was trying to collect from uh, from of course google uh, it, i found that nurse led translational research uh, if uh, example one is improving the emotional well being of major trauma patients and uh, if be, if you put the wiseman etl etl you will find that you can read this in detail Uh, they did a research that resulted in implementation of an intervention that for the first time in australia provides a clear process for screening and referral of the injured patient in need of mental health support so uh, this is a simple study and i think uh, in india lot of such studies are done but they are not published under translational research in nursing so i was trying to find out the the indian study but uh, i was unable to find because this work around which i told you is also one of the example but i think it is not being published still under translational research we should publish these so that when we require that these are the translational studies done uh, in india Uh, uh are also going into uh, the review process or people are able to see that uh, when we look for citations also we don't find in in studies much on this uh, next slide i try to give the whole uh, detail uh, which you can read later on this is the uh, the abstract which i thought i will put into this so that you can read what was the aim background methods used and the major results and conclusion was that the translation of findings resulted in implementation of an intervention that uh, they are using for uh, for screening uh, next slide please translational research in nursing another example is nurse led translational research uh, that is changing state wide stroke practice um, this is related to the practice used uh, for uh, stroke cases and uh, next slide in this study also uh, next uh, in this study also the result uh, provides rare evidence of successful research translation of class 1 level b evidence across an entire state <coughs> in short time frame in the real world of clinical practice <coughs> next slide then third is genomic analysis of uh, a painful peripheral neuropathy and this in this study also uh, the uh, the findings revealed that uh, g uh, gan they call gan 1 and uh, uh, g gan oxin play a role in pathophysiology of peripheral um, painful peripheral neuropathy Uh, next in next slide it is described uh, I, i think okay this one i did not describe in detail but uh, the conclusion is there next slide uh, just to conclude so that we have time for interaction also uh, to conclude i would say that the interaction of several disciplines is required uh, for uh, to translate knowledge from one type of research to another and the primary focus is on dissemination and implementation research or the sy- uh, systematic study of processes and factors that lead to widespread use and successful integration of evidence based interventions into real world clinical and community setting uh, translating best research evidence can make for a more transparent and sustainable healthcare services to which nurses are central and more importantly the translation of evidence can bring about cultural behavioral and practice change reducing the research practice gap